All right, so pause. And welcome to episode four, Grace Upon Grace. Uh, we're glad you're joining us uh, for this video podcast. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Pastor Larry Chitwood. We're excited to have our special guest with us, uh, Ali Bozy and Lindsay Byard. Uh, Y'all may remember Lindsay from episode two of Grace Upon Grace. She was uh, so good enough to join us for this episode. This week we'll be talking about uh, the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. Um, I, I don't like that she's anonymous. Um, can we give the woman at the well a name? Sam. Sam. Let's call her Sam. So we'll talk about Sam, uh, the woman at the well named Sam. Um, before we get started, uh, Rose, would you like to open us up in prayer? Yes. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for today and we're thankful for the many ways that you bless us and keep us and grow us and prune us, God. I pray um, just over this time that we have together and that we can be one with each other and one in your spirit, God. And I pray um, just for the conversations that are had, I pray that they can be fruitful. And I pray that um, that this can be beneficial towards us, even if that's the only thing, God, I pray that this can um, bring some joy to your heart. I pray that for the people listening, I pray for them as they listen and as they um, just take this in, God, I pray that it um, causes all of us to question and wonder and um, just to collaborate together, God. We love you and we thank you for everything you do for us. In your name I pray, amen. 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 Allie. Would you like uh -oh. to introduce yourself? <laughs> My lovely to. friend, Allie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a guest, Rose, and Pastor Larry for having me. Um, my name is Allie Bosey. I met Rose at the Walk to Emmaus. Um, I am a third year master's student at Mississippi State University working on my master's in sociology. Uh, I got my undergrad in criminology, and my goal is to work in prisons. I already do a little bit of ministry in prisons for the past five years, and uh, I teach job tra training skills and job retention and try to reduce recidivism rates, which means so people don't get rearrested, and uh, just kind of like equip people to take on the world. That's, uh, That's awesome. about it. <laughs> what's, your, what's your favorite thing about working in a prison? Or working in the uh so I'm actually writing my thesis uh I'm proving the point that or I'm trying to prove the point that a holistic approach to programs within prisons for re-entry that uh the spirituality component really matters and so um getting to be a part of a ministry here in Hope Works uh in Memphis and a part of a Kairos division like I just see so much more success stories than what I you know read about when it's just job training, like, yes, there's good job training, but when you add the spirituality component, it, it really makes a difference. And I see it. So getting to see that in God's work inside these walls is definitely the coolest part. So this is my last question then. So Hope Works is a Memphis-based ministry, right? It's a nonprofit. Yeah, they're a 501c3. And uh, it's, it's a faith-based organization. There's several faceted, like they have English as a second language and, uh, like high set classes, which is the new thing for GED. And, but what I'm a part of is called the personal and career development program. So it's like a 13 week schooling, um, mm -hmm. but it's teaching job skills, but a component of that is spirituality and like faith and finances and counseling so it's it's a holistic approach opposed to just this is how you get a job go get this job we hope you keep this job <laughs> yeah so um it's hope works is in memphis is there any ways like even during covid and all the stuff going on that anyone can like support this ministry or plug into this ministry or like donate anything like is there anything y'all got going on that people yeah, listening or we can plug yeah, so they're always accepting donations. Actually, the majority of 
the faculty is, or the staff is staffed by donation dollars. Mostly, I, I don't want to speak on that 100%, but I know tons of donations come from churches all around Memphis. And I mean, they're always, they have a clothes room and a like hygiene and care room. So any hygiene products, clothes, baby clothes, they take anything because it's just, it's not just in the prisons. It's also just in like, um, Ra not Raleigh, but like, Highland and Summer. So it's over in that like Binghamton area. Um, mm -hmm. They serve the Orange Mountain community also. And so, you know, people need like interview clothes or baby clothes. They can come up there if they, if they're one of our students or have been one of our students in the past 30 years, they can come up there and get supplies. So yeah, you can definitely do that. And then the other thing would be is we do uh, a mentor program as part of the PCD program also. And so that's in the prison. It's once a week. And so a lot of our mentors are older adults because they're retired. So they have that space to, to commit weekly. And so that's definitely a way to get involved, but not during COVID. So we're, yeah. we're just kind of waiting on all of that. So right now donations are about the only way to participate, but uh, after, you know, once things are hopefully back in motion one day, I'll uh, definitely plug y'all in. The that. Where's the ministry housed? And what prisons do you work in? Uh, so Hope works specifically. The one that I interned with twice in Memphis and who I'm writing my thesis on is at Highland in Summer. Uh, I think it's 3377. Don't quote me on it's that. It's like around the Something. corner from like Inspired Cafe, isn't it? Inspired Community yeah, Cafe. Yeah, it's only like a mile from the yeah. university. If you, if you take Highland down to Summer and take a left, it's right there by the Tops Barbecue and okay. the fire station. Um. And then they they serve, like I said, in the Memphis Penal Farm um, over at Shelby Farms, or not the Penal Farm, SCDC. And then um, that's just Hope Works. But then in Mississippi, in Starkville, because I'm still enrolled, I serve at, um, I do, I like help instruct Thinking for a Change with one of my professors. And we do a 12-week program, but that's not faith-based. And then here in Memphis, or not in Memphis, in Henning, Tennessee, like 45 minutes to an hour north is the Tennessee State Penitentiary and I'm involved with Kairos there. And that's where I go like monthly and do Bible studies, but we're also not allowed to do that right now. And so trying to get Rose involved with Kairos with me next go around once we're allowed back in, but. Yeah, so we should also connect you with uh, Reverend Diane Harrison who has uh, okay. Grace Place, which is a United Methodist Church that's housed in the women's prison at West Tennessee State Penitentiary. Uh, yeah, that's. that's yeah. And um, also uh, MICA, uh, which is uh, uh, Memphis Interfaith Community. Inspire supports MICA. I've heard of them also. Right. Yeah. And um, Eliza Ford is the reentry person. Uh, Rose, you might connect uh, Allie and Eliza. Okay, I'll be looking for a job in the coming months. <laughs> So, uh, and Lindsay, we've met you before, but uh, I'll help introduce Lindsay. Lindsay is an artist, theologian. She and I went to uh, graduate school together at uh, Memphis Theological Seminary. Uh, pastor, teacher, uh, what, what did we call you before? Deer whisperer, carpenter, uh, just an amazing all around person, gardener, uh, baker, uh, everything. Tell us a little something about Lindsay. You just told him everything about Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said it all, Larry. And today's I mean, your dad's birthday. Huh? And today's your dad's birthday. Today is my dad's birthday. It is true. And what's your dad's yeah. name? Ken. Happy Your birthday, Happy Ken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, there's something I left out. Come on, Lindsay. What's your favorite food? Oh, you know, I'm a big, I like sweets, a lot of sweets. And a couple of years ago, I had to stop eating all gluten products. So it's still sweets, but I kind of had to get creative and figure out that whole gluten free kind of thing. But probably, yeah, that's probably right up there with favorites of all, mm -hmm. like candy, cupcakes, cake, cheesecake, you know. Um, I like to say something healthy. I mean, I try, but it. But if we're going favorite, yeah, hands where's, down. Where's your favorite place? Favorite place, like space, just to be Lindsay B. 
Oh, at my house. At your house? <laughs> at my house. It's a cool spot. You're in yeah, your I mean, now, yeah? Yeah, I'm in my studio. We have a studio out behind the house and we live in Somerville and it's a little over an acre, but so we're still in a neighborhood, but we have a good bit of space to kind of go and just be outside. And um, I mean, I spend majority of my days in here in the studio. So um, it's a good thing that it's a favorite place to be. So, I mean, I teach um, at Lausanne one day a week, optional classes. I wasn't there at the beginning of the semester just because COVID and trying to get everything figured out, but I'm supposed to go back November to January. And it's, a, it's an optional arts program they do after school. And then I teach, um, I do paint parties with a senior living community at Cherry and Park. It's Town Village at Audubon Park. And um, I love that, they're good people. And I just got to go back, last month was my first month back since March. So that was fun. All right, and there's uh, over my shoulder, you can see some of Lindsay's art. Uh, in our house, Lisa, uh, in mine's house at home is adorned with Lindsay's amazing art. I, I come up with these ideas and I call Lindsay and then she turns it into amazing art. And then I call her at the last minute and say things like, Lindsay, have you finished that piece of art that we talked about? Well, why? Um, well, I want a caterpillar in it. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can put a caterpillar in it. <laughs> yeah. That's the absolute truth. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Um, well, sweet. Well, thank y'all for being here with us today. Um, let's go ahead and read about Sam. How's that sound? Does that sound fun? Sound fun to you? So keep it in mind that we're exploring the Gospel of John, and we're looking for ways that the characters in the Gospel of John uh, can help us be better disciples, what we can learn about discipleship in John's Gospel. Uh, today, we're in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. This is a rather long story, uh, the story of the woman at the well. Uh, the one, the uh, Sam is a Samaritan woman. I guess that's why Rose chose to call her Sam. Um, the story that Immediately precedes this, Jesus has an encounter with Nicodemus. That was episode three with Ed Ducey. Uh, uh, Sam is a much different character uh, than Nicodemus. Remembering also that the characters in John's gospel don't just represent individuals, but often a whole swaths of the community. So while Nicodemus was a man of letters, educated, very wealthy, so he would represent the elite, uh, uh, Sam represents a totally different aspect of uh, 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 people in the community. So we can listen for who Sam represents as, as we hear the story. And it's um, John 4, uh, verses 1 through 42. And I'll go ahead and read that once I find it in my Bible. All right, so now, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, that's John the Baptist, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Jesus' disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. You see, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to Jesus, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, 
Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, Jesus' disciples came back. They were astonished that Jesus was speaking with a woman, but, but none of them said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah. Can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for the harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. When the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Word of God, for we, the people of God, thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. So there's a lot there, a lot going on. Uh, insiders and outsiders. Uh, Jesus is in Judea. He's going to Galilee. Judea's in the south. Galilee's in the north. Samaria's in the middle. Um, the Judeans, uh, the Jews, the more, I guess, uh, favored Jews. Jerusalem was in Judea. Uh, in the south, uh, uh, devout Jews avoided Samaria. Normally, if you were traveling from Jewish territories in the north to Judea, Jewish territories in the south, you would go around Samaria. So it's interesting that uh, John, the storyteller, 
It says Jesus had to go through Samaria. Um, but for some reason, he had to go. And he finds himself at the well where he meets Sam. Anyone have some thoughts on Sam or the story they want to share right off the bat? I see Rose. Lindsay, Gray. what you got? Huh? Did you say what do I what got? What you got, Lindsay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, the the big thing about this story, I think it's always interesting, I think, when you read scripture, because depending on where you are in your life and time, it speaks to you differently. And mm -hmm. so when I've heard this story in the past, um, the, the thing that has always been brought up, it seems like when people preach it or talk about it or there's a study is here's this woman who she's uh, probably a sinner and she's coming to the well in the afternoon instead of the morning. And he says that, you know, she's had all these husbands. And so that usually goes directly to um, God will use the sinner, you know, to, to heal the people. And so in the past, that's what I've gathered from the story because that's what was preached you know, mm. but, um, when I look at it, it never says go and sin no more, you know, what she, you know, you're healed, go and sin no more, or really the idea of morals never really come about except for the statement of how many husbands she has had. And she doesn't apologize for it. Matter of fact, she doesn't even say anything other. She says, I have no husband. He tells her, and then she says nothing about it, but just move on. Um, and so I thought that was interesting because it was just a different perspective on possibly what I've always heard versus what I was able to see. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, um, that was a big thing that stood out to me. And then am I supposed to talk about discipleship? Am I just supposed to talk about that? You what? talk about whatever you want. When you buy it. <laughs> well, I was looking, I mean, looking at the word as you said it on my notes. So I think, yeah, the discipleship's a good route to take. <laughs> Um, and, and another thing about her that I had thought about this, this time is that she seems to be uh, very knowledgeable, uh, in her faith and she doesn't seem to be intimidated at all. You know, the time that he says something that she doesn't say something back and she mentions, you know, parts of her faith, you know, and her beliefs about, you know, Jacob and, uh, the well and the land and she talks about the ancestor she calls him a prophet and so it seems as though um, even though you know man woman might not supposed to be talking that sure shouldn't be talking alone she doesn't seem that doesn't seem to bother her um, as far as the back and forth you know um, but it, the discipleship part I think there's an awareness that she you know, is willing to see him and not turn around, you know, walking towards the well. And she goes by herself at a time. She's probably going to be there by herself. And here's this man at the well and she doesn't turn around and run. She doesn't, you know, not scared of him. Doesn't like, Oh, I don't want to deal with him today, you know, and go, but she's, you know, aware she sees the other person and she stays for the conversation, you know? Um, and then of course we see that she leaves and goes and tells other people, you know, with enthusiasm and the come and see and, and that whole thing. So I think there's just a lot of different dynamics of discipleship, you know, that she points out, you know, as far as her role in the story. Yeah. And I like what you pointed out that Jesus doesn't talk about her five previous husbands in a way that even remotely indicates that it was a sinful Mm -mm. thing we we just do that with our brains with our mm -hmm. way of understanding it and uh but he, he doesn't bring that up at all he doesn't indicate that at, at, at all and I, if 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 people have been keeping up with the podcast in in the first podcast i said one of the the, the in the first chapter of john's gospel the first 18 verses are a roadmap for the whole gospel of john and in the first chapter of John, the first encounter with Jesus, when he encounters the very first disciples, Nathaniel, uh, when he meets Nathaniel, uh, he knows all about Nathaniel. You know, he says, yeah, I can tell, I know that you're a man of God, because right before you came and met me, you were sitting under a fig tree 
uh, reading the Torah, reading the studying the law. And Nathaniel says, how do you know so much about me? You must be a man of God. And that's the same thing that Sam says. How do you know everything about me? You must be a prophet, mm -hmm. you know, a man, a, a man mm -hmm. of God. Well, and even like, sorry. well, and even like with the, um, like he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't come at her like, Hey, um, here's this thing that's wrong with you. Let me fix it. Like he's, he comes at her and invites her into like conversation. He invites her into relationship with him, like from the start, like that's, that's his main intent. And so I think that if we're thinking about, I mean, you can take that into like evangelism. Like if I'm, if I'm like supposed to be sharing the gospel or sharing who Jesus is, like, that doesn't mean, Hey, here's why you need this. It's, Hey, here's this thing that I love. So let's have a relationship. Let's talk and like, let's um, get to know each other and um, have that base before I, before anything else happens. I don't know. But, and then also um, thinking about like, yeah, like she came there at noon because right, like the um, people, the women that would go get the water, the women, the children, like that was in the morning time. Like they would do that in the morning when it's not so hot. And so she came, um, at noon because she's like I don't want to deal with anybody and if the thing that like we've and this is something Allie said like the thing that we've been taught to think about her the um thing like the fact that maybe she was possibly promiscuous or whatever we've been <laughs> I'm sure she's like you know what I'm gonna go at this time of day because then I don't have to deal with anybody getting on my case like <laughs> And I'm speaking for myself, like if I'm ever like in a time or in a space where I'm like, man, I just don't want to see anybody. I literally don't want to deal with anybody. If I was like heading over that hill, like I see them well in the distance and I see this man sitting there and I don't want to deal with anybody. I already know that in my brain. Rose would have turned away from Jesus. Rose would have been like, I mean, I didn't know it was Jesus, but I would have just I would have just walked away. I'd be like, nah, I'm going home. I'll just be thirsty. I don't want to talk to anybody right now. <laughs> and like, and just in that, I think that's something that we can learn from her just in discipleship, like being open, regardless of our predispos like predisposition. Like if I'm tired or if I'm like, you know what? I really don't feel like this today. And like, if I'm open to the possibility of whatever God has for me in this moment. Like that means that could mean going and talking to somebody that I really don't feel like talking to right now. <laughs> like, but because she was open to that, she got a blessing. Like she got blessings times a million because of after the conversation, what she did, she ran off and told everyone. And we see that the fruit from that was all of these people entrusting their lives to God and trusting their lives to Jesus. And getting Jesus to hang out with them a little bit longer because they wanted to take in his knowledge. So I don't know. Well, I think something, I think something like just staying on the beginning of like him coming to her, like we, he was, he was doing what pastor Larry said, like they didn't do. He went through this town. He wasn't supposed to go to. And like, like discipleship's about making yourself uncomfortable. It's about like breaking these, I, I, like idealistic rules that we've just internalized as the way that things are like he went to her where he wasn't supposed to be you know quote unquote but he, he was breaking a rule and and it ended up being like a you know rose said this to me the other day like a divine appointment like he was supposed to be there with her at that time and and she didn't run and even <laughs> If Rose is having the bad day, Rose might run away. But if Allie's having the bad day, she still needs to get her water. So Allie's still going to sit here and get her water and just pray to the Lord above that you don't speak to me. But when he <laughs> did, he spoke to her. But like, if I had had a bad day for real, and the way that he spoke to her wasn't condemning her and wasn't being like, like y'all said earlier, like, you know, he knew everything about her. And and that's like you said in evangelism, like we're supposed to go to the people and tell these people the gospel. But how 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 can you expect people to believe the gospel if they don't want to be approached by you, especially if they've got a predisposition predisposition to the story of Jesus already? So like I just I kind of like that he broke some rules and he went to her and and she was open and mm -hmm. you know 
that one-on-one -on -one interaction was so important for them. Like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And like, well, and thinking about the, just the level of rule that he was breaking, like, I mean, take like being a Samaritan woman. So her identity, her identity is a woman, her identity is a Samaritan. And like already being a woman, she has one card stacked against her. Then being a Samaritan compared to the Jews, she has another card stacked against her because they already did not mesh. They didn't like each other. Like What's that Jews word? Were seen as better. What's that sociology? Say? What's that sociology? That word? word is starts with an I. Intersection. Sectionality. So intersectionality. <laughs> look it up. It's a great thing. But intersectionality. I missed it for a second. But intersectionality, like that's her, that's where her, that's the things that define her. That's where they cross and how it affects her and how people see her and view her. And so Jews don't see Samaritans as equal. They see them as lesser. And because she's a woman, she's even lesser, lesser. And so, and during that time, they, uh, women that were Samaritans were yearly unclean. Like, because like when a woman is on her, uh menstruation destination like she's unclean can't touch her can't be around her she needs to separate herself but because she, but then they had that rule where the samaritan women were always unclean and so that was just not a fact but that was like just a saying against them like hey like this obviously isn't true but we don't like you so you're just bad but so yeah he was breaking rules like they would never have crossed like they shouldn't have crossed paths but they did because it was a divine appointment and it was something that needed to happen. It needed to happen for her. It needed to happen in the life of Jesus and his, in his story and his ministry. And like, so yeah, no. Well, Super and the powerful. way he went about the appointment too, like, like he, you know, he said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Like in evangelism, like when you go and talk to somebody, if you, if you talk, if you just talk to them about what they're, you know, doing wrong, like just getting the regular water, living their regular day, you're not demonstrating the living water that he's talking about, which is, which is what we're told to do is like be his hands and feet. And, and that's the way that he approached her. So that's, you know, what I take away at this time in my life is how I should approach people. So can I give you uh, a gift from uh, Larry? to Allie for your uh, intersectionality and sociology work. Um, and I use, I wrote this in a paper when I was in graduate school. So intersectionality, when uh, my story meets your story, we might have God's story. Ah, <laughs> that's great. I will never forget that one. That's for sure. <laughs> so let's talk about the rules, uh, because the rules often cause wounds, right? Paul tells us that over and over and over. That when we learn about the law, we learn about our sin. You know, um, and the rules are uh, deep and old, from 600 BC. Uh, BCE, excuse me, before the common era, um, uh, the, the divide between the Judeans and uh, are the, because Samaritans were Jewish people, right? Everybody in this story is, is of Jewish heritage. It's just that the Samaritans had intermarried with the Assyrians at some point when the Assyrians colonized that part of Israel right, which was not a part of Judea. It was a different tribe of Israel. And, and the, the Assyrians had, and, and they were at war with, with Judea. And the Assyrians had colonized that part and they had intermarried. And uh, the Judeans believed that they had stayed pure and they looked down upon the Samaritans. And, and, uh, and so uh, they didn't consider them to be a pure race of Hebrew people. And so they were unclean and, and, and Rose mentioned it, especially Samaritan women were considered unclean from birth. They could never be clean or holy. So not only was Jesus, she was doubly unclean because she was a single woman and he was a man. He shouldn't be talking to her. And she was a Samaritan woman. It's just like in Harry Potter <laughs> where the like full blood witches and wizards like would look down on the half blood that, like married muggles who were just regular people but that's that's what i think of 
I'm lost there, but uh, yeah, that sounds good. I've never it. seen it. It's true. Yeah. Um, so there's some deep wounds here. And, and that's where I go to when Jesus says, when, when, the, the, when the gospel writer says Jesus had to go to Samaria. I'm wondering if there's not only the wounded life of Sam that might need some healing or absolutely does need some healing because we all have wounded lives that need healing. But if there's a wound between in this Jewish family of the Judeans and the Samaritans or the Jews writ large and the Samaritans that needs healing, that Jesus is there to heal as well. A 600 year old wound, a deep wound. Um, but that's not about discipleship. So we don't have to, we don't have to explore that unless y'all want to. Well, it's kind of about discipleship. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of because like, I think on, when I was looking at it, I think there was, you know, some things with Sam to learn about discipleship, but I think I probably gathered more from Jesus about discipleship in this one. And so some of the things that, um, that I thought that I, you know, kind of recognized or saw that I liked, you know, the rule breaker thing that we talked about, you know, that he was willing to, to go and to talk to the woman. He didn't really care, you know, what other people were going to think about that or say about that or, you know, anything. And then um, I, I like that it was in a common place. You know, he met her where she was on her journey already. You know, she was already coming to the well. She was already in an environment in which she was comfortable with. Um, so he went to her. And often, sometimes we want people to like come to the church or come to a Bible study or mm -hmm. come to us rather than going to where they are and meeting them on their journey. Um, so I like that part. And then um, I feel like when he told her about the husband she had had and who she was living with, that he was able to name a part of her uh, without shaming her, that he, it was like an, I see you. And then we just move on, you know, and I think sometimes we tiptoe around everything, um, you know, in community and church, we don't want to point out sometimes what the obvious is. And even when we do, we don't do it well you know, not with the same grace um, that he offers here. But I think there is something about that to be able to, you know, name something about somebody's identity without judgment um, and then still offer them the living water. Uh, that didn't deter him from offering her the living water. It didn't deter him from using her as, you know, a reconciliation or evangelism or anything like that. And um, I like how he that reconciliation that healing um that connection between communities started with one person mm -hmm. and like in the beginning you know he sends the disciples you know to do their thing or whatever and he could have tried to use them but i feel like he used someone that was a part of the community you know so sometimes i think we come in with the troops you know so to say and this is what we want to do this is how we think it should happen this is how healing should occur instead mm -hmm. of getting somebody in the community that knows the culture and has been affected and mm -hmm. use them to build that bridge. And I feel like that's what, you know, that's what that offered. Um, and then I also like that uh, Jesus stayed, you know, they asked him to stay for two days and he stayed and built that relationship. Um, so it's because sometimes it's like, we want to uh, evangelize and leave. You know, I'm going to drop you a track and go. I'm going to put some on your door, head out, have a brief conversation with you, and I'm gone. And not that we can necessarily stay two days, but if somebody says, hey, can you stay a little while and talk about this a little longer? Or, you know, do you think you could come back next week? Or, you know, can we talk about this at a different time? Being open to that and building that relationship, you know, I think that's important because I think really, you know, community of believers are really about the community part of it. You know, and so I just think that's a good example that he didn't head out of town, you know. Yeah, and who think who learned from that? The the other 12, 12 right. disciples that were there. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I liked that um Sam, the Samaritan woman, uh didn't have to be the center of the community or the center of the faith community. Because the yeah. story ends with them saying to her. We, we believe, thank you for introducing us to Jesus. And now our faith is moving on because of what we've experienced, right? Yeah. It's not like 
she had to be after that she was the boss or she mm -hmm. was the, right. the pastor or yeah well i think it's like also we see like in just the what we can learn from sam like we see the obedience like we see the open obedience and regardless and i think that like what gave her like we see open obedience we see courage but what gave her that courage who who like who gave her that courage was jesus jesus was like hey maybe you are like downcast maybe you are like bottom of the barrel in this community but guess what like i'm gonna empower you because like i'm not putting shame by you like i'm not i'm not associating your name with shame like i'm i'm telling you that like regardless this is something that I'm offering to you. And this is something that I'm going to empower you to go do and like have that, have that cycle going. Because I think sometimes like shame, like everybody deals with shame. Everybody deals with shame, like on different levels and in different situations, but shame is something that can take hold in every single person's life. And I think that like you bringing that up, Lindsay is so important because if we are, if we're just causing that cycle of shame to just continue in someone's life, like that can be so problematic. And I know like we've all probably been there from time to time, you know, and instead of like cutting that cycle of shame off in that person's life, we, we may have added to it. And so we can learn from Jesus not to add to it, but we can also learn from her, like to go, to go and do like to, when we've experienced, that part that divine appointment whatever it is like wherever it is it doesn't have to be in church on sunday it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. at bible study like you said it could be at a party on a sun at a saturday on a saturday night it could be at the grocery store it could be at a baseball game it could be just walking your dog in the park like wherever that is wherever we have that moment with jesus if we share that and keep that cycle going of just freedom and sharing that with people like we don't know the fruit that could come from that and she doesn't I'm sure she knows some of the fruit that that came from that because the people were telling her about how much they loved like getting to know Jesus I'm sure but like at the same time like what about those people that she shared that with after that or those people that they shared that with after that and so like I just think that there's a real beauty in not cutting off and keeping our like in experiences with the divine to ourselves but like being open and um, vulnerable like vulnerability and like sharing that like um I think that that's something that we can learn from Sam in this story well yeah. I think oh go ahead no you go ahead Lindsay I'll follow you um I think it's interesting though like I'm not even sure she felt shame I mean maybe she did mm. You know, maybe, maybe that is why she went, you know, at a different time, or maybe it was for another reason. But, you know, the interesting thing is, like, she has something to say for everything he says. She yeah. doesn't hesitate to question him. So she seemed like she seemed to me, she seems pretty grounded and strong, you know, like strong mm -hmm. enough to, to do that with a man, you know, mm -hmm. she's there alone, you know, and she doesn't lie. She says, I don't have a husband. You know, she doesn't try to beat around that or, well, let me explain, or this is what had happened or, you know, there's none of that. And um, so I think that there's like, you know, and then when she decides to go and tell everybody, you know, she doesn't hesitate to go into the community, you know, whereas yeah. we might think, well, maybe she doesn't want to go. She doesn't make any excuses. Like we see other people make excuses, you know, Jonah doesn't want to go. You know, the, you know, not I stutter, not I, I don't want to go talk to my people. You know, I've been with all these men and they think this about me. She doesn't say any of that. She yeah. le she leaves the jar. The whole reason she came, you know, she's got that living water and she's gone. Yeah. And she does it with such a way, such a passion that when she gets there and says, you know, come and see that they're willing to go they don't even say this is that crazy woman that has all them husbands i'm not following her anywhere <laughs> they don't, that doesn't happen you know they're like okay we'll go with you we'll go see what's going on and so there has to be you know i feel like there has to be probably more than we've in the past given her credit for yeah. for other people totally. this, you know other people in the community be like okay let's go see what she's talking about and then she goes you know with such energy which often sometimes we lack I think as Christians, mm -hmm. sometimes we're like, 
let me tell you what Jesus did. You know, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like a miracle is no big deal anymore. You know? He walks yeah. With me and he talks with me. Yeah. He tells me on his own. <laughs> right. But, you know, people, people will come for, you know, that energy and that passion. And so, you know, I, I just wonder if there was really, I mean, we, the story has always been told, you know, that she might be carrying a heavy burden or whatever, but, you know, she kind of holds her own in it. I, I don't know, you know, if she really has yeah. that or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I literally building off of what both you said, like, um, you had said yesterday, Lindsay, that he, that it was almost as if she was ordained in that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, like when Jesus approached her and yeah. there's, um, there's a casting crown song and Megan, their female singer sings this one. And it's, she says something about how God's always knocking at that door, but you, but you have to open the door and let him in, you know, and not just once, not just for belief or unbelief, but like often he's knocking but also for belief and unbelief and so she was she he was knocking she allowed him in there so as though she's ordained in that moment she she was vulnerable and she went and shared and there was something about her that made them listen and and that's like I mean Pastor Larry said the first 18 verses of John line this out for us you know John 1 1 in the beginning was the word the word was God and God was the word like we're given this word and we're ordained in this moment and like we're supposed to use like our personal experiences, like Rose was saying, and be vulnerable and like go out there and show them like, Hey, I'm not telling you you're wrong, but this is like what the living water gives me. And she, I, I agree with you, Lindsay. I don't, I don't know that she was feeling shame. I think she knew that everybody maybe thought of her that way. So she just didn't want to put up with it, but but they still, they, they listened to her. And so when the, this woman that had done all these wrong things, if everything we infer about her is true, that she came in there and they were like, oh, okay, well, if she did that, then like, I can have what she has that's making her like vibrant, lively, full of energy. And so, you know, back to the evangelism, like that's just how we're supposed to do it. Like we're equipped with this word that is the only version of Jesus we have. He's not going to come sit next to me. He might, but you know well and i think it's two folded too like i think we have you know there's that responsibility to share the word you know as a disciple but i also feel like as a disciple it's our responsibility to be open and listen to the different shapes and forms in which god will come to us because mm -hmm. i think often you know just like we said he chose her for that moment you know the disciples before this were all baptizing all these folks and then he sends them for food you know what it is? I mean, so it's like, and then he's going to use her, you know? And so he, he anoints her and he chooses her for, for this time and for this moment and for this community. And I just think about, you know, sometimes we're a little particular about who can share God's word and mm -hmm. who can deliver a message and who can bring reconciliation. And we want this to be not someone who's been married five times, not somebody who's living with somebody uh, but they're not married. We don't want it to be, you know, all of these things because that's not what good church people do. Mm -hmm. But in this story, God chose her. He anointed her. She went and did without any hesitation. And then there's reconciliation and there's a whole community of believers afterwards. And so I yeah. think there's that be willing to go like she goes, but also on the flip side of that, there's be a person in that community who's willing to listen to who God appoints for that moment. I feel like there's um, Bishop McAlilly in the service of uh, licensing, commissioning and ordination quoted uh, Fred Craddock, who was a professor of homiletics at um, Emory uh, School of Theology. At, I mean, Candler School of Theology at Emory University. And he told uh, Bishop McAlilly's class, he said, the problem with your call to ministry is that God doesn't always say it loud enough that everybody hears it. Hear me, Lindsay mm -hmm. Baird? Oh, I, I, look, I know. That God doesn't <laughs> always articulate your call loud enough that everybody hears it. Yeah. Um, he's, Jesus sent 12 hand-picked, or however many hand-picked disciples into that village and they came back with a sack full of beans and some rice maybe some beef jerky 
you know, a loaf of bread, some spam, maybe some mustard. He didn't even send Sam. He just told Sam about herself. Mm -hmm. He let her know who she was. And she took off running on her own. I used to do some prison ministry, Allie. And uh, often wondered, what am I doing here? Right? Sadly, as in learning more than you're teaching. Huh? I said learning more than you're teaching. Yeah, learning more than I was teaching. And sadly, like in most prisons, you know, the majority of the men that I worked with were African American. So what's this? And, and I have a past. I'm a pastor with a past. I, you know, I did a lot of things that should have landed me in prison uh, up until age 42. And, <laughs> um, and I would try to reach back and be that person, you know, try to build some cred with these guys, right? But at the end of the day, you know, I'm a fluffy, fat, white pastor with a master's degree and lives a very comfortable life uh, but then then I would hear it from them thank you for giving up your time you leave your safe place and your family and you come in here and you care about us but when I heard y'all talking about this story Sam does something that the disciples can't do they can't do it but Jesus knows that Sam can do it right when Kairos goes into a prison and does Kairos ministry, it's not the six or eight or 10 persons from that prison that are a part of that Kairos weekend. It's the hundreds of men or women that they're going to encounter day after day after day after day after day mm -hmm. after that weekend. That's what we talk about. We talk about that. That's a huge thing in Kairos. Just it, it, it's the women and who they're going back to in the dorms and the facilities and and they have whole communities on these campuses like I want Kairos in every prison but yeah that I mean and that's what it was with Sam too like she went and told all these people and who knows who they went and told and I feel like that's our job like we we can't we can't sit and you know make everybody believe everything that we believe but we are supposed to share our experiences and tell what we know and then got only God knows who they'll go and touch. Can I have a question? Can I ask a question? Um, so, <laughs> uh, you can ask reading this, no, we answer not allowed. One, can ask another one. <laughs> so, read. Okay, so like thinking about lenses and like the importance of looking through or how people view things from their own lens. So like thinking about this story as a woman and reading the story as a woman, is there any insight that um, the women in this video podcast have on reading this? I mean, I do. What is it? <laughs> well, I mean, I just, I mean, it, I guess it should, it just goes, you know, with, um, you know, it just depends on the context and tradition in which, you know, you're raised, but, you know, there's a lot of people that would argue that a woman is not supposed to be, you know, ordained or appointed or anointed or teaching unless it is to nursery, children, youth, or other women. Mm -hmm. Um but here we see that it doesn't say that she runs and goes and tells the other women of the community, you know, or that she, you know, goes and leads a cute little Bible lesson with the children of the community, you know, um, that she runs and tells the whole community, which, you know, is going to be men, women, children, you know, it sounds like she was going to tell anybody who would listen. And so I think, you know, it just goes back to God is going to use who God wants to use for the moment he wants to use them. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think, you know, so, so often it's an, another time where we try to limit, you know, what God can do and who he's going to use. And so, you know, for women who are listening that may be in a tradition that somebody tells them that they can't deliver that word, you know, that they can't be that voice. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. God, God doesn't give you something, you know, 
those things that burn within you that you have to get out, that you have to share with somebody, uh, that's because you're supposed to, because God has mm -hmm. given that, you know, to you. And, you know, um, I just, I just think don't, you know, don't limit why God might use you because of shameful things or because you're a woman, you know, or because maybe you're not a leader in the community or you don't think, you know, your class in a community is important. God, God will choose who God will choose, regardless of, you know, gender, race, you know, all of the things. Um, and I just, I, there's, this isn't the only example. There's example after example. So I don't even know, look, I don't even know why people think, you know, think how they think, but I, I just, people who are listening, uh, you know, let God use you if he's given you that message. Yeah, definitely. I have a, I'm going to turn my computer around so I can read it to y'all. I have a sticker on my computer and it says, Jesus protected women, empowered, honored, released, confided, was funded by, celebrated, learned from women, respected women, and spoke of women as examples to follow. And yeah, I was definitely one of those people who was raised, uh, you know, the men are the leaders of the church, the men are the leaders of the house. And, you know, if, if you're a masculine man, sure, by all means, be that person. And if, if you want to go find you a feminine woman, then fine. But yeah, I definitely, as I've gotten older, have, have learned that God's been able to equip me and the women that he's put in my life. I, like literally as soon as I entered like junior youth group in middle school, I had a female youth leader and I was like, I understand what she's teaching me better than what any man's ever told me in my whole life about Jesus. And then, you know, just at that point, not discrediting men, I love men, but that women can be used that they're, you know, no, it, in race, gender, like we're all made in his image. We're all made good. We're all, we're all, all our doors are being knocked on. Like he wants to use all of us. And, you know, I'm only 24, so I'm still learning how this, this woman's going to be used, but it's cool to see when he talks to women, his longest, con this is one of his longest conversations with a person that's not his disciple, you know? So that matters and God and Jesus knew it mattered. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to cry when you say that. <laughs> Don't cry. No, I, it's okay. You can cry. Um, <laughs> I think I agree. Like when I read this and like just piggybacking off of you guys, like I think that reading this, like, every time I read when Jesus talks to a woman, like I just get, I, I know that he sees us. And so in all of the times when, when we're not seen, or I'll speak for myself in the times when I've not been seen um, because of my gender, like I'm reminded, well, Jesus sees me and Jesus saw me as important. And Jesus saw all of these women in a time that doesn't even compare like like oh my gosh like I can't even imagine and like just if this is like beautiful in my life for Jesus to see me I can't even imagine being Sam and having Jesus look at me and be like you know what like let's go girl like let's get it like I got I got some plans and I want you to be a, I want you to lead it girl like and I don't know. I think that's really beautiful. And I think that's really empowering. And I think that's something that we can hold on to for the time when. Um, but, oh, God. Yeah. I just think that's something we can hold on to. I think too, that, you know, it's something important to remember is that, um, you know, all of this took place, not in a temple, not in a mm -hmm. church. Um, and so sometimes I think we look for, you know, a platform sometimes we don't feel noticed if we don't have that platform to speak um and so sometimes you know women might feel you know like i've sat in meetings where i felt unnoticed regardless of whether it was because i was young because i was a woman because it was you know whatever it was but come to find out jesus works in other places besides just the church and so you can be you know that voice don't wait for somebody to say yes, you're ordained and yes, you're appointed to hear, or yes, this is now your congregation, or this is your Sunday school class now, because you don't have to have those titles. You don't have to have those platforms or those communities, just like she didn't have to have that to go and be an evangelist for him. Yeah. So I think, 
you know, even if you get that no or not here or not now, or that's not what we believe or our culture, or we don't support women or whatever, he will align you in the places you need to be with the people that need to hear your voice. He will open those doors for you. Mm-hmm. Man, I can't even imagine like <laughs> after she, she was obedient in this time, like all of the other things that she did with her life after that. You know what I mean? I think that's really like beautiful to think about. Yeah. So before anything else is said, I want to say this. That, uh, I see you, Reverend Rose Vitrano. Mm. And I see you, Reverend Lindsay Byard. And that uh, even though uh, when God calls, uh, uh, the voice might not be loud enough for everybody to hear it, uh, you hear it. And you Tell hear Allie it. you see her. I see you. Right. <laughs> I see you, Allie. I'm like, they're ordained. <laughs> We're all, oh, man. we're all called uh, when there used to be a cokesbury store here uh, uh i would go in there before i was uh a clergy person and i went in there so much that they started giving me the clergy discount and they would say are you clergy and i would say you know uh peter says we're all we're, we're all priests <laughs> we're that it means and the bible so, got you i see you too Allie. So read your bible see you. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read that church sign that said, uh, we're either all ministers or we're all, all imposters. That's right. But, uh, gosh, there was something else. I, was I can't remember what it was. But it was so profound. And uh, I was going to man, I was gonna mansplain the whole woman thing. Oh, I know what it was, that I wouldn't be here. Uh, I, you know, I grew up in a tradition that women weren't ordained in. But when I... I'm just laughing because I'm laughing at your mansplaining. Well, I, I'm laughing at your joke about mansplaining, but continue. <laughs> not mansplain it. But I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a, a, a groundbreaking uh, woman elder in the United Methodist Church, Reverend Martha Wagley, who is my pastor, and she paved the way for women in the in the Memphis Conference of the United Methodist. She was one of the way pavers, way makers, and um, I have a total respect and um uh and they have yeah so thanks for being here we We see you larry (laughs) um so we are are getting to our time um where we should probably wrap up does anyone have any closing thoughts (laughs) Allie, i do have the the one a uh, big Casting Crowns fan here. Mark Hall and me are real tight. Not really, I wish. Um, <laughs> but one, one quote my dad loves by him, and uh, when I told him I was going to be doing this with you guys, he was like, well, you better tell him about that Mark Hall quote that I've always been telling you since <laughs> you're little. And uh, he said, Mark Hall said, she thought she was standing next to a well talking to a man, but she was standing next to a hole in the ground talking to the well. Mm. And that's beautiful. Me, so. Mm-hmm. That's one I wanted I to be sure to share at some point today. So I guess it's my closing thought here. So we can disclose if anybody's taking the time to watch this to the end, this is the second time we've recorded this because yesterday we recorded it and had a lot of fun. No, yesterday we did this and had a lot of fun, but I forgot to push the record button. Yes. Today I just looked up in the corner to the left to make sure it said recording. Oh my I thought, why didn't I do that from the beginning? But we recorded it today. we're good um so before we close in prayer i just want to tell you guys um first of all Allie, thank you lindsay Lindsay, thank you you. oh yeah it's an honor larry larry thank you rose thank you god thank you everyone listening thank you um and uh if you would like to please please leave us feedback leave us feedback or i'm gonna cry just leave us some feedback (laughs) i'm just kidding but Whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube, you can, if you see it on YouTube, comment on YouTube. If you see it on Facebook, comment on Facebook. If you see it on the blog site, comment on the blog site somewhere. Tell us. And I'm going to be honest. It may be that that people, it may be that people aren't seeing it because I didn't see last week's and I follow all of your stuff. So I don't know how to make it more visible, but they're both like, 
dumb. <laughs> yeah, but they're like, uh, yeah, you might, I'm just well, saying you might, you might need to either share it like on your personal page. Cause like Larry, I see your posts and your personal stuff, but I never Arlington UMC doesn't come up a lot. And so like, I have a studio page for my art stuff, but I don't use it because people said they didn't see it a lot, but my personal page comes up. So maybe like y'all need to share it on your personal page and get other yeah. people to share it so that it's more visible, I think. Yeah. Done. Yeah. All right. Tell me, I'll share so, too. Just let me know. Us and give us, give us, tell us if you have, if you have a thought or a question or something that came up because you are just a brilliant thinker, please leave that and we'll talk about it in the next podcast because we just because we're talking doesn't mean that we're the smartest people. You could very well be smarter than every single person here. If you watch <laughs> this podcast, you'll know that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, Allie Bozy, would you like to close us in prayer? I'd love to, Rose Vitrina. Thank you. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together again. Um, thank you that we got this recorded this time. Uh, it was it was an honor again talking about the woman at the well. I need to be reminded of it every day. Uh, to everybody listening, I, I just pray that we all understand that we can we can cross over the lines and we can love like you do and we can make ourselves uncomfortable and go to these places and we can understand that you know God doesn't come to take away all our problems but to fill us with this living water so that we're empowered to face them and then we can use that to go and do what we're called to do. And uh, I just pray that you fill us and you know let us be your hands and feet in this world and uh, we love you. Amen. 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 Love you all. Love and you. Love God. Love everybody. Do y'all hold on yeah. real quick? Do all y'all see how it says in the top left corner recording? Yeah. So y'all all can double check him next time. <laughs> um. Okay. Sad. Love you. <laughs> Bye. Love you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Hey, and we saw. I saw.